This can be confusing. I'm just, just I'm recapping not, what yeah, Mark said. I'm not editing that out. I'm just going to make you look like a total fool. Okay. Uh, good, good. You know, you know that's that's what I would do, Tom. <laughs> Leave in all the mistakes. Cut out all the good points. That's how, yeah. that's how you keep a network together. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's my kind of podcast. Hello. And welcome to the 20th episode of Karl Marx's 18th Premier of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Thursday the 21st of January 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. Today we start Chapter 6, The Victory of Bonaparte. This week I have the new patron Leah Naama Ten Brink and Kyr Myreng to thank. If you like extra patron only episodes and live streams, Head on over to Patreon. Every comedy dollar really does help me keep these episodes flowing. I was recently a guest on a new podcast called Auxiliary Statements, where we talked about all things comedy. Dan and Jack have recently launched their podcast a couple of months ago and are currently doing a series on the book Cybernetic Revolutionaries by Eden Medina. Jack also recently helped out by editing a couple of these Brumaire episodes, which are in the tank and waiting to be released. So thanks a heap for that, Jack. The episode, I think, is coming out sometime this week, so make sure to check out both the episode, where you get to hear me answer some questions for once, and their podcast. Okay, let's join the crew. We are going to today do chapter six, the victory of Bolian uh, Napoleon Louis Bonaparte. <laughs> I have, I've, I've been drinking people last night. I've had, I have a hangover. Most of us here are all in some kind of various state of disarray. By the way, uh, Tom, Bolians are the blue species from Star Trek with the, uh, the bald heads. Yeah. So um, Bolian Napoleon. <laughs> Oh yeah, that, uh, yeah. That, the the not, really blue ones with the that, uh, not with the antennas. Those are the Andorians. They're one yeah. of the, the four founders of the uh, Federation. But uh, the Bolians, they're the, they're the bald ones. Uh, anyway, it put an image in my head of Napoleon uh, the Third as Bolian, and it's not going away. <laughs> that's that's staying there for sure. I don't know. Just happy to hear about the burning cop cars. Happy to hear that you can't just disappear, dissidents. Without uh, without consequences, it's nice. It's a uh, it's a good feeling. Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting to the disappearing of people. Fucking hell! Study your marks, people. Trump has found his agency. He's found his arm of the state, which is the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, which right. has, I think, I... more than more than the CIA, the FBI, and some other thing put together in numbers. I think it's like forty to fifty thousand. Yeah, you know, pe- people built that up thinking, oh, that's only for out-group. It's never going to be used on in-group, you fucking morons. Good job. Good job. Yeah. So the yeah. same things that's been happening to, happening to immigrants is now happening to dissidents. Remember when the libs were just head over heels in love with the security state like a year ago? No, that didn't take long. The, the funny thing is that the fucking resistance, quote-unquote, like the bullshit anti-Trump, Stuff like all of a sudden took up forms of physical resistance when it like narratively fit, like which was fucking surreal. Yeah, yeah, yeah they were yeah. like actually smashing like Fed shit. All this, all the cynics and skeptics were, were like, all the cynics I should say were like, ah, the movement's over. We had our flare up, and now we have our recuperation. Let's just go back to talking about COVID. Nope. No. Nope, it's it's still rolling. This is too deep of, of an aspect of class struggle to to just go away like that again. This is going to be here for five to ten years in some form or another. That's my prediction. I mean, if if this is going to sure. keep happening, then we have, you know, I don't know. It's a promising start to, like, class struggle reappearing, the rebirth of history, you might say. Absolutely. I am very interested to talk about you know, last time we were saying this moment is very different from what we see in 18th Brumaire. I still think that's true. I still think there's significant differences going on here. But I, I will say Trump seems to have found his, like, society of December the 10th. He's got his running dogs to go out there and, and uh, try to basically incite 
civil unrest so as to give him an opportunity to uh, claim the mantle of the party of order. Doesn't seem to be going very well for him, though. So, you know, great. I I hope he completely eats shit. <laughs> do, you, do you think... I don't think they're really, like, the Decemberists. Are they not just, like, I don't know, like, some kind of weird national guard? <laughs> yeah, they're not exactly the same thing, but there is a kind of overlap of, like kind of like one foot in the security state and one foot in just sort of disorganized pro-fascist politics. And I, I think that that's somewhat analogous to what we see with the, the Society of December the 10th, where like, yeah, some of the people, you know, Marx just sort of points out as being lumpen, et cetera, et cetera. But like some of the people were clearly just like sympathetic, you know, soldiers and police and whatnot. Anyway, they seem to be taking orders directly from Trump. And I think that's the the, the key point here, which is uh, analogous. Uh, they're, they're not, this is not like something that is happening at a lower level of coordination within the security state. This seems to be like directly politically motivated by Trump in order to try to create a, a pre-election situation for himself uh, especially given that he's more or less in the same way as Bonaparte sort of stated, you know, it would be nice if term limits were removed. It'd be nice if I didn't have to resign when I, when this election was over, just kind of making these sort of pro coup musings in the media. Again, I maintain he's not as smart as Bonaparte, but uh, he's, he's, he's doing some sort of similar types of behavior. I, I think there are some analogies that can be drawn, even if the rest of the situation is totally different. God, okay. the DHS are a bunch of cucks, man. I mean, like, at least uh, December has got sausages. What are they getting besides the wages of whiteness? The sausages of whiteness. <laughs> sausages of whiteness. <laughs> exactly. It's a kind of a weird one, though, because I can imagine, uh, well, I've read somewhere that the, internally in the Department of Homeland Security, there's very little morale. And I believe that like, so I think it's easier to get like a group of your actual supporters, like the Decembrists to do stuff. That's a more stable coalition for you as an actor than uh, mm-hmm. that top, top down command structure, uh, structure of the state that is uh, with poor morale. It's, it, it's kind of a, uh, it's, it's not as good a, a fit. I wouldn't think. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Most, most of Trump's, Active supporters seem to be dedicated to giving themselves COVID and anti-mask protests. So let's just uh, hope nature takes its course there. Did anybody hear there was a case there, I think it was from somewhere like in Houston or Texas or somebody, where they're, they're throwing these COVID parties where, like, if you get tested positive, then you throw a house party and all your mates come and see if they can catch it from you. And this f- <laughs> fucking, he was only in his 20s, he caught it. And he was lying in the hospital on his deathbed. And he was like, God, I think oh, I've God. made a mistake. Oh, that no. Party. That's like, awful. Isn't that fucking... Oh. I, mean, was, I thought, like, a COVID party were just people that said, oh, let's have a fucking party during COVID times. Not, I have COVID. Let's come and see when I spit in your face, you catch it. Oh, yeah, God. like a weird bug-catching party. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking. They, you know, I used to kind of scaremonger about these yeah. uh, minority of... Uh, um, HIV seeking uh, homosexuals, you know, during the 80s. Like, I wonder how much of this is like played up by the media. But yeah, that's bug catching. That's weird. But as to as to Carl's point about people not taking it seriously, I mean, like in London right now, two doors down from me last Saturday, there was a house party with like at least 40 people, like in a small house. So like in London, <sighs> it's like completely out the window. So people are essentially having bug catching parties like by proxy almost <laughs> like not even not even like realizing wow. that that's what they're doing it's pretty crazy. here here's a moist <laughs> towel at it, moist yeah. towel that's for everybody make sure to wipe your face with that yeah and this and the police don't care like there was a stabbing outside my house on the same night and the police were like investigating that and there was clearly this house party going on and the police just didn't give a shit you know so it's like obviously a stabbing is more important than people having a party but it's like clearly like there were people like spilling out of the house onto the street it's kind of crazy. Not like pro-social Darwinism. That's weird. 
Yeah. <laughs> they were do they were having parties here like I live in like a near I live in like a pretty progressive area of the states and they were having parties here like in April and March like at the peak of social distancing. There was a soiree in Connecticut that uh temporarily made that state the covid capital before New York blew it out of the water as New York always does New York fucking New York. And but, uh, I can only imagine that there's parallel events happening in Rona Zona. You know, sands the wine. The fact that there's no, know, like, but... second round of aid coming, I, I feel like that's the make-or-break moment. If he could give another round of Trump checks and bullshit, instead mm. he's going with all this, like, let's open the schools. You know, what's a few million dead kids? He says, I think mail-in voting is going to rig the election. I really do. And then when pressed on the issue, he says, uh, I have to see. Look, you. I have to see. No, I'm not going to just say yes. I'm not going to say no. Incidentally, they're trying to destroy the post- postal service at this time to uh, create all kinds of confusion over mail-in ballots. Fuck. I'll tell you what. All the libs flipped on e-voting. They're, they all sound like Paul Cockshot now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before they were like, oh my god, Koch brothers, voting terminals, you know, there's a big Russiagate conspiracy to make it, you know, to rig e-voting. And now they're like, oh god, if there's no e-voting, there just won't be voter turnout. Help, help computers, we trust you now. Black Mirror season, you know, six didn't come out, so, you know, (laughs) in my goldfish (laughs) memory, I'm not scared of it anymore. I I just took a flight from from, uh, London to Dublin it was probably a third full, so it was quite full. And, you know, people were all wearing their masks. And then it's only a short flight, like it's only like, what, 50 minutes, an hour tops. And what do they do? Halfway through the flight, come down to the trolley and give them people snacks. So what does everybody do? Take off their fucking masks to eat like a packet of crisps in a fucking air-conditioned small space with like fucking 80 people. Like, what is the logic of that? They're actually like giving people crisps to eat when they should be f- on a fifty-minute flight. Yeah, yeah. That that flight is literally like you go up and come down pretty much. God, the only thing you should consume on a fifty-minute flight is half a Xanax. Half a Xanax. Fuck's sake! I took my mate is a, a pharmacist, and we were going flying an early morning flight to to Italy one time and uh, going skiing. It was like six o'clock flight or something, and uh, it was like a two or three hour flight. And uh, he gave me like a Valium or something to help me sleep. Oh, been out the and I, I took the Valium anyway, and I was sitting on the plane and I was wearing this kind of like woolly jumper thing. And I, I totally like got just knocked out and I started drooling and I drooled, <laughs> I drooled the spit all the way, like from my mouth, all the way down to the bottom of the jumper. And I had, a, I had apparently the boys were laughing at me so much. Like they said that I, there was a continuous line of drool for two hours. <laughs> when I woke up, all my like clothes were wet. And oh, I, God. I was getting off the plane. Like the air hostess were like pointing at me and laughing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's one right out of the How to Be a Bastard playbook, Tom. Yeah, that was a good one. Never again. Okay, let's get going here. We're, we're talking a lot of shit talking here today. 20 okay. minutes in. So it's here good. we are today. Thanks. We are doing the 18th Brumaire of Louis de Bonaparte, as everybody knows. Chapter 6, The Victory of Bonaparte. Like, There's actually quite a lot of really good analysis in this, even if we know where, what, what's happening. So I think, Kyle, I like starting with you. Will we take a, a good lump to start with? The coalition with the Montagne and the Pure Republicans to which the party of order saw itself condemned in its unavailing efforts to maintain possession of the military power and to reconquer supreme control of the executive power, proved incontrovertibly that it had forfeited its independent parliamentary majority. On May 28th, the mere power of the calendar, of the hour hand of the clock, gave the signal for its complete disintegration. With May 28th, the last year of the life of the National Assembly began. It now had to decide for continuing the Constitution unaltered or for revising it. But revision of the Constitution, that implied not only rule of the bourgeoisie or of the petty bourgeois democracy, democracy or proletarian anarchy, parliamentary republic or Bonaparte, 
it implied at the same time Orléans or Bourbon. Thus fell in the midst of Parliament the apple of discord that was bound to inflame openly the conflict of interests which split the party of order into hostile factions. The party of order was a combination of heterogeneous social substances. The question of revision generated a political temperature at which the product again decomposed into its original components. The Bonapartist interest in a revision was simple. For them, it was above all a question of abolishing Article 45, which forbade Bonaparte's re-election and the prolongation of his authority. No less simple appeared the position of the Republicans. They unconditionally rejected any revision. They saw in it a universal conspiracy against the Republic. Since they commanded more than a quarter of the votes in the National Assembly, and according to the Constitution, three quarters of the votes were required for a resolution for revision to be legally valid and for the convocation of a revising assembly, they needed only to count their votes to be sure of victory, and they were sure of victory. As against these clear positions, the party of order found itself inextricably caught in contradictions. If it should reject revision, it would imperil the status quo, since it would leave Bonaparte, Bonaparte only one way out, that of force. And since on the second Sunday in May 1852, at the decisive moment, it would be surrendering France to revolutionary anarchy with a president who had lost his authority, with a parliament which for a long time had not possessed it, and with a people that meant to reconquer it. If it voted for constitutional revision, it knew that it voted in vain, and would be bound to fail constitutionally because of the Republicans' veto. If it unconstitutionally declared a simple majority vote to be binding, it could hope to dominate the revolution only if it subordinated itself unconditionally to the sovereignty of the executive power. Then it would make Bonaparte master of the Constitution, of its revision, and of the party itself. A partial revision which would prolong the authority of the president, would pave the way for imperial usurpation. A general revision, which would shorten the existence of the republic, would bring the dynastic claims into unavoidable conflict, for the conditions of a Bourbon and an Orleanist restoration were not only different, they were mutually exclusive. The parliamentary republic was more than the neutral territory on which the two factions of the French bourgeoisie, legitimists and Orleanists, large landed property and industry could dwell side by side with equality of rights. It was the unavoidable condition of their common rule, the sole form of state in which their general class interest subjected to itself at the same time both the claims of their particular factions and all the remaining classes of society. As royalists, they fell back into their old antagonisms, into the struggle for the supremacy of landed property or of money. And the highest expression of this antagonism, its personification was the kings themselves, their dynasties. Hence, the resistance of the party of order to the recall of the Bourbon. The Orleanist and people's representative, Creton, had in 1849, 1850, and 1851 periodically introduced a motion for the revocation of the decree exiling the royal families. Just as regularly, Parliament presented the spectacle of an assembly of royalists that obdurately barred the gates through which their exiled kings might return home. Richard III murdered Henry VI, remarking that he was too good for this world and belonged in heaven. The royalists declared France too bad to possess her kings again. Constrained by force of circumstances, they had become Republicans and repeatedly sanctioned the popular decision that banished their kings from France. Okay, this is the first time we've like read this and it feels really narrating-y. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you have two two factions of the party of order squabbling over each other, got like lining up behind something that they would have never supported before. You've got a you know executive figure that's like, yeah, maybe I will recognize elections, maybe I won't. Yeah, I just have a <sighs> marginal note that says CF the U.S. Republican Party. 
<laughs> uh oh. When you say CF, you mean what? Cross reference. I can't help but think of the two factions of the party of order to be the you know existing halves of the one party, two party state. Yeah, absolutely. There is uh, that that sense because you know if in fact Trump does refuse to acknowledge election results. There will be some kind of constitutional revision that is required. Mm-hmm. In fact, indeed, if not in uh, in writing, why would it make any difference? Because if he didn't, it'd be unconstitutional anyway, wouldn't it? Right, but, but uh, because because of an amendment um, after FDR's presidency, so yeah. yeah. But couldn't you just like? Couldn't you just be like, uh, well, you know, that's just a piece of paper. Like, I don't care. Like. You'd have the security state basically eat him. Like a, a good portion yeah. of the security state would turn against him, like physically. Yeah, that that would be the required action. He might be able to get away with it, just being like, "Okay, well, I'm just gonna go again. I don't care about this piece of paper." And... <laughs> I mean, it it you know American civic religion, Puya. You haven't been out of the country that long. <laughs> I- I I, like, I really well maybe, uh, well, maybe uh, I maybe I like. Yeah, like, okay, yeah, maybe people would be, like, really upset, but, uh, like, it could totally just happen. Like, I, I, don't, I, feel, I feel like he doesn't need to, like, revise the Constitution. He can just be like, okay, like, I don't even care about the Constitution. Like, I, I feel like in, 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 like, it would definitely be un, unpopular, but, like, the thing is more, not so much whether it be unpopular or not, but would he be able to do it? Could he actually, like, if he had 40,000 fucking Boardland security police fucking end up, wind up in Washington, you know, and he says, I'm doing this, and they surround his, you know, like, as in, it's a kind of a wacky scenario. I don't think it's yeah. very really I, I, It's, it's I a know. wacky scenario. You would have yeah. a QAnon, like, you would have the QAnon factions oh, of, you know, the executive at Civil War with the, you know, constitutional loyalist factions. And it would be interesting times. The, I don't see it happening unless something very traumatic happens before that point. Right. Mm, like I, an enormous I, spike in, in pandemic. No, I think more I, so. I think it would have to be like some kind of a threat to the some kind of a massacre or something to justify that type of a, a behavior. The, mm. No, the, I the feel soldiers, like it could be the protest. The soldiers in America are all sworn to defend the Constitution. They've made an oath. There's a clear justification for them acting in that situation. Like, I'm not saying that that binds them to that course of action, in fact, but the justification is clearly there. I don't, I don't care if you have a bunch of DHS people defending you. Like, it, it just seems very unlikely he'd be able to hold on to power. I think you'd see a pig civil war, honestly. <laughs> well, we don't like, like uh... that's one way of defunding them. Well, yeah, I don't I, know if it could successfully happen, but I feel like that. I mean, there's a possibility it could successfully happen. I mean, yeah. like, I feel like the chances that it could successfully happen are like uh, non-zero. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I think sure. they're non-zero, but they're not. <laughs> I wouldn't say they're above one percent currently. I feel like um, I think it was Kyle. Like, he made a good point that, like, yeah, the military and the security state. It, I don't think it would fly with a lot of them. So I think that would be the big deciding factor in whether or not it would successfully happen. But I also feel like, like, I feel like he has a good chance of winning just because, like, there's no real opposition. A skeleton of a human being might be able to beat him at this point, and that is who is running against him. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to say something off-brand. I think we might be being too Nishean in using history for life. Maybe we should get lost in history for a bit take this on its own terms you know it is a bit too resonant to ignore uh, maybe we can put it aside and come back to it later yeah because yeah. again the the everything in the surrounding situation is different like you know these royalist factions are facing down the prospect of anarchy but the actual street fighting the resistance of the people in the street has been completely suppressed at this point in French history, right? 
the the security state has actually shut up the popular opposition in the streets. That is not the case in America. It's Certainly a very different not. situation. Well, I think they're trying to... I think the Democratic Party just assumed they'll be able to fold it all into the Democratic Party. That's my honest belief. Yeah, but that sure as shit wasn't what the party of order was thinking, you know? Yeah, absolutely. In, 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 in French history at this point. Like, it's it's a different situation. Oh, completely different, yeah. And I think the, 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 the Department of Democrats now are wrong if they think they're just going to do an Iraq war demonstration on it and fold it into Obama. I, I just don't think that can happen. I think it's a totally different scenario. But um, what I like most about this chapter is that he is how he, like, basically explains to us how the contradictions inherent in these political positions have to or are in the process of breaking apart and tearing, say, the the current system apart. Like, I think there's a lot for us to learn from his analysis of how these contradictions move and, and behave that when we look to, say, the current situation. Yeah, I I think, you know, the thing that's really, that in reading the section on the party of order here, the thing I'm reminded of the most is kind of like uh, actually game theory, right? Like Marx yeah. is Marx yeah. is sort of working out the payoff matrix for the party of order and their its constituent factions. Yeah, precisely. It's like a it's, it's like a <laughs> it's it's actually yeah, it's closer to game theory than say chess. It's more like a an actual solving of a, you know, a, a poker uh, situation than chess. He's he's looking at the <laughs> you know, the expected return from all these outcomes and what they are supposed to do you know in a kind of a, a kind of a monetary expected return scenario it feels more like that than it does feel about strategy naughty naughty we sound like analytical marxists shudder to think but yeah obviously he's laying out the balance of forces and entertaining a sort of i don't know proto formalization you know it's not exactly von neumann you know analysis here but you can see how that would be useful in formalizing what Marx is saying. If nobody has done that yet, there's your ticket. I really like this line he has here about Richard III. <laughs> this is a killer of a line. Richard III murdered Henry VI, remarking that he was too good for this world and belonged in heaven. The royalists declared France too bad to possess her kings again. <laughs> so good. So good. Oh, yeah. Man. You naughty, naughty French. You cannot have us. Not until you're better. Is there anything else we want to pick out of this before we go on to the next bit? Because it's going to play itself out now soon. Yeah, I just want to draw attention to the uh, Shakespearean tragedy of the party of order breaking bread just to completely fold in on itself. You know, the, the legitimists and uh, Orleanists. You know, making common cause, trying to, you know, sort out their differences and completely neutralizing themselves in the process. Yeah, I feel like there would be a good costume drama in the last days, of, excuse me, in the last days of the party of order. Like a fall of eagles kind of deal? Yeah, exactly. I was thinking like some of those sort of like mid 20th century costume dramas about like, Ooh. you know, royal houses falling apart. Cromwell with Richard Harris or something. You'd have to have John Malkovich in there as well. Who would he play? Just get Patrick Stewart as Napoleon the Third. <laughs> that could work. I was thinking about that. What's that kind of really small? No, no, no. Patrick Stewart would have to play De Tocqueville, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess he's a character with more gravitas. Yeah. <laughs> He made a good Lenin in Fall of Eagles, so he's got Bonapartist cred. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, we, we're going to move on here, I think. We've got a very large section here to kind of consume in one go. A revision of the Constitution and circumstances compelled taking that into consideration called into question, along with the Republic, the common rule of the two bourgeois factions and revived with the possibility of a monarchy. The rivalry of the interests which the monarchy had predominantly represented by turns. The struggle for supremacy of one faction over the other. The diplomats of the party of order believed that they could settle the struggle by an amalgamation of the two dynasties, by a so-called fusion of the royalist parties and their royal houses. 
The real fusion of the Restoration and the July monarchy was the Parliamentary Republic, in which the Orleanist and Legitimist colors were obliterated, and the various species of bourgeois disappeared into the bourgeois as such, the bourgeois genus. Now, however, Orleanist was to become Legitimist and Legitimist Orleanist. Royalty, in which their antagonism was personified, was to embody their unity. The expression of their exclusive factional interests was to become the expression of their common class interest. The monarchy was to do what only the abolition of two monarchies, the Republic, could do and had done. It was the philosopher's stone to produce which the doctors of the party of order racked their brains. As if the legitimist monarchy could ever become the monarchy of the industrial bourgeois, or the bourgeois monarchy ever become the monarchy of the hereditary landed aristocracy. As if landed property and industry could fraternize under one crown, when the crown could descend to only one head, the head of the elder brother or of the younger. As if industry could come to terms with landed property at all, so long as landed property itself does not decide to become industrial. If Henry V should die tomorrow, the Count of Paris would not on that account become the king of the Legitimists unless he ceased to be the king of the Orleanists. The philosophers of fusion, however, who became more vociferous in proportion as the question of revision came to the fore, who had provided themselves with an official daily organ in the Assemblée Nationale, and who are again at work even at this very moment, February 1852, considered the whole difficulty to be due to the opposition and rivalry of the two dynasties. The attempts to reconcile the Orléans family with Henry V, begun since the death of Louis Philippe, but, like the dynastic intrigues generally, played out only while the National Assembly was in recess. During the entr'actes, behind the scenes, sentimental coquetry with the old superstition rather than seriously meant business, now became grand performances of state, enacted by the party of order on the public stage instead of in amateur theatricals as before. The courier spread from Paris to Venice, from Venice to Clermont, from Clermont to Paris. The Count of Chambord issues a manifesto in which, with the help of all the members of his family, he announces not his, but the national restoration. The Orleanist Salvendi throws himself at the feet of Henry V. The legitimist chiefs, Berrier, Benoit de Azzi, Saint Priest, travel to Clermont to persuade the Orleans set, but in vain. The fusionists perceive too late that the interests of the two bourgeois factions neither lose exclusiveness nor gain pliancy when they become accentuated in the form of family interests, the interests of two royal houses. If Henry V were to recognize the Count of Paris as his heir, the sole success that the fusion could achieve at best, the House of Orléans would not win any claim that the childlessness of Henry V had not already secured to it, but it would lose all the claims it had gained through the July Revolution. It would waive its original claims, all the titles it had wrested from the older branch of the Bourbons, in almost 100 years of struggle. It would barter away its historical prerogative, the prerogative of the modern kingdom, for the prerogative of its genealogical tree. The fusion, therefore, would be nothing but a voluntary abdication of the House of Orléans, its resignation to legitimacy, repentant withdrawal from the Protestant state church into the Catholic. A withdrawal, however, that would not even bring to it the throne it had lost, but to the steps of the throne where it had been born. The old Orléanist ministers, Guizot, Duchatel, etc., who likewise hastened to Claremont to advocate the fusion, in fact, represented merely the Katzenjama over the July Revolution. The despair about the bourgeois kingdom and the kingliness of the bourgeois, the superstitious belief in legitimacy as the last charm against anarchy. Imagining themselves mediators between Orléans and Bourbons, they were in reality merely Orléanist renegades, and the prince of Joinville, Louis-Philippe's son receive them as such. On the other hand, the viable bellicose section of the Orleans, Thiers, Bazet, etc., convinced Louis-Philippe's family all the more easily that if any directly monarchist restoration presupposed the fusion of the two dynasties, 
and if any such fusion presupposed abdication of the House of Orléans, it was, on the contrary, wholly in accord with the tradition of their forefathers to recognize the Republic for the moment and wait until events permitted the conversion of the presidential chair into a throne. Rumors of Joinville's candidature were circulated. Public curiosity was kept in suspense, and a few months later, in September, after the rejection of revision, his candidature was publicly proclaimed. The attempt at a royalist fusion of Orleanists with Legitimists had thus not only failed, it had destroyed their parliamentary fusion, their common Republican form, and had broken up the party of order into its original component parts. But the more the estrangement between Clermont and Venice grew, the more their settlement collapsed and the Joinville agitation gained ground, so much the more eager and earnest became the negotiations between Bonaparte's minister Faucher and the Legitimists. The whole game, they tried to join together forces to get you know, a, a unified royal house in order or a unified line. And the actual fact of trying to join them laid bare how split they truly were. And there was no joining these two. One group of Orleanists said to, you know, uh, Louis-Philippe son, well, let the other guy be, be, be king first and then you can have your go next. And that was basically putting them straight back to where they always would have been a secondary royal family. And then the other group basically said, no, here's what you should do. You should just run for president. <laughs> and then in, in proper French fashion of uh, political mess ups, they'll probably see they might just make you actually king again after a while. I and mean, you can bide your time as president. Yeah, that's that's the kind of implication, isn't it? That, that Jeanville's candidature, they're just like, yeah, and then you'll probably just end up, you know, making that move anyway. So there's almost like an, an implied Bonapartism in that route anyway. Yeah, like a, it's like instead of emperor, it's king. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> God, there's a sort of hubris that, you know, the party of order usually shows against like rising figures, you know, first Bonaparte, then our turn. Then, then they get like liquidated. I mean, it is sort of surprising that, you know, merging the monarchists in this way ends in their collapse. Like, you know, if we're going to talk game theory again, you know, you should be able to combine your forces and have a bigger block. Maybe let's get into why this dissolves their legitimacy, no pun intended. As in, like, like why, why the Orleanists will not merge with the the Bourbon? Yeah, it's because they have different class. They represent different class interests. Like one is the, yeah. feudal, and they want to dominate over money, and then the other is money, and they want to dominate over feudal. And you know, he says that it's a great line in there where they basically said that the landed the landed aristocracy would need to industrialize before they could have that merge. So. One thing I, I was just reflecting on in, you know, listening to this is how, I guess, fortunate the British monarchy was to not be split in the time of transition from basically feudalism into capitalism. Kind of a lot of contingencies at play in, in England. <laughs> yeah, like, because... You know, obviously there are, there are the, the 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 Tories and the and the and the Whigs and so on, and they they were split according to sort of town and country interests. But if you have this kind of cemented dynastic competition between those factions in a situation of like high political indeterminacy, it's it's very difficult to overcome when you have those class interests motivating the, the alternative candidacies for the throne. You know, just it, this kind of idea of two things that have the same, you know, they don't have the same actual material class interests, but similar class interests being unable to unite. It does strike me as like the kind of classic split of the revolutionary left of anarchists and Marxists. It does ring some kind of, warning bells to me hmm, interesting the thing that comes to mind for me is uh well first of all as an american you know when you have basically both parties are just a big coalition of like hodgepodge of different kinds of class interests and yeah it's mostly like big bourgeois but then there's like you know rentier landlords that are they they are behaving like capitalists but you know not exactly like industrialists or whatever 
But then on the other hand, there's the legacy of the Civil War and the falling apart of a sort of class compromise between industrial bourgeoisie and a a sort of uh, pseudo-aristocratic slaveholder class. You know, depending on what moment in American history you're kind of centering, you can you can get Marx's point here that like their class interests are just way too different for them to actually merge, even though they have some similarities in political form. You know, let alone the cultural differences of you know Protestant versus Catholic, and you know which monarchy you stand. Right, and I guess in the case of Britain, now correct me if I'm wrong because I'm kind of fuzzy on this part of history, but like. With the ascension of the House of Orange to the throne, the Glorious Restoration, that kind of dynastic competition was kind of put an end to. Is is that correct? I think pretty much because that's like the end of the that's the end of the Glorious Revolution, right? Uh, it's it's the end of the Civil War, uh, the restoration of the of the monarchy under the House of Orange, who, who like you know comes over from. Holland as yeah. basically a pro bourgeois king. Yeah, I think that that's probably fair enough. I'm not super. I'm not super down with that period of history, to be honest. It's it's just it's just interesting to think about what would have happened in Britain, even if they didn't have a republic, if you had competing houses in a, a much more serious way. It might have been a different history. Mm. One thing, one thing that is interesting, picking up on what Tom said about how they kind of disintegrate, and there are, you know, in the disintegration, the two competing and antagonistic kind of, um, you know, the legitimists representing the kind of landlord class and the Orleanists representing kind of finance capital and the industrialists. Kind of that that stark binary is kind of, you know, made apparent. But later on, kind of reading into Orleanism, as you get into the 1880s, they tried this fusionism again, and it did stick. So I've not read into it far enough, but it's interesting that there must have been kind of in the intervening period between the 1850s and the 1880s, you know, because later on in this chapter, well, Marx goes into kind of great depth about the kind of the wider political economy and the context that brings about this moment. But something must have shifted between 1850 and 1880 to allow well, those have, two factions to align. You have the Second Empire, right? And the ascension of finance capital, the use, the sort of uh, Saint Simonian use of the state to promote capitalist development. You know, there's a big economic shift in France that happens under Bonaparte. And so that's probably what actually made the, the merger possible. Yeah, that would, I mean, that would certainly follow from Marx's analysis that that would be the yeah. key difference. Did anybody see there about a, a month ago on Twitter when in, I think, Kentucky, Louisville, they knocked over like the statue of King Louis and his direct yeah. descendant, uh, like, I think it was, I think they're the Bourbon, I think their legitimate descendant was on Twitter <laughs> saying, uh, this is an outrage. You know, my great, 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 great grandfather would be saddened to see this day. <laughs> 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 Thanks for giving us some shot and Frida from the grave, I guess, you know? This is like when oh, Mussolini's like granddaughter weighed in on the soccer shit. I'm sorry, football. Oh, yeah, but like boy did like boy did they get roasted, you know. It's one thing what's um, like that's amazing. Memory, but like fucking Louis the fucking fourteenth. Like <laughs> great, 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 great grand 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 grandson. Like given fucking oh, hey, Black Lives Matter was fucking unique. <laughs> yeah guy must have a humiliation kink to trot that out on twitter that's hilarious i think he's got like fucking forty thousand followers probably all like weirdos maybe not 40 like, like seventeen like, thousand followers yeah like monarchists that ever like <laughs> <laughs> they're all monarchists i swear lost cause <laughs> <laughs> i need something dead to stand <laughs> sometimes i think you know we're you know, some of some of us are nuts for standing something from like 100 years ago or 50 years ago then you hear about these guys makes me makes me feel the teensiest a little bit a little bit better
On this episode, you heard the team tune The Order of the Phronic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats.